So if the Lord has spoken to me about doing some things for me, with me, and I am a father, the fulfillment of that is often contingent upon the discharging of my duties as a good, as a good father. Good fathers are governors for God and they are the navigators of his will and purpose. Point number two. Good fathers are governors for God and they are the navigators of his will and purpose. They command their children and their household. That is governorship language. I have chosen him so that he may command, he may direct, he may navigate his children. Command them, direct them, navigate them. We will expand that, explode it a little bit more in a few minutes. Good fathers are governors for God. They are the navigators of his will and his purpose. It's not just about having a child. There is something that fulfills for us emotionally, fair play. There is something, there is a sense of psychological well-being that comes from knowing that all your biology works right. I appreciate that. But that's not all there is to being a father. From the scriptures we're learning from this guy. And mark this. You can read Genesis 24 later. Abraham carried on his fatherhood role way into Isaac's 40s. Isaac turned 40 and Abraham took it upon himself to find a wife for his son. His son was not a teenager. He was a 40-year-old man. We live in a time when everybody wants to marry for love. Heck, I married for love. I mean, <laughs> but for the grace of God, right? My wife will tell you the same thing. We're quite open about these things. We've been on the precipice a couple of times. It's no big deal. The big deal is that we made it back. <laughs> and I love her more than my heart. Married for love. You need to get some people involved in your choice of marriage. Abraham was. He was still discharging his duty as a good father. Somebody says, oh, they're on their own now. No, we don't want to get, we don't want to interfere. No, I'm going to interfere. I intend to interfere every step of the way till I take my last breath. I don't stop being a father because my child got married. Hello? Especially that boy child of mine. Woo! I'm going to interfere with him so much. <laughs> Fathers establish legacy through their good stewardship. What did God say? He said he will keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Fathers establish legacy through their good stewardship of righteousness and justice. You preserve your posterity by doing righteousness and justice. Otherwise, the sins of the father are visited often on the children. The punishment of my wrongdoing can affect my children. Someone's going to go, oh, you're that man's son. Okay. All right, righteousness and justice. Remember, it's not just about you. Fathers set up their posterity. They set their posterity up to be greater than them. My fatherhood is more than just about me. God says, so that I may bring upon Abraham that which I have spoken to him. Now, what did God speak to Abraham? He said, you will be the father of many nations. Your descendants will be many. In fact, when God speaks to Abraham, he spoke to him more about his posterity than about himself. And as we know, he really only had one child of promise. Isaac. He didn't have, so, he didn't have many kids. One child of promise. But his posterity is supposed to be, to, to be blessed. That's why God said, I chose, note this, I chose him. Because of these qualities, question is, do you and I want to walk in line with those same qualities? Or are we just happy enough to be called children of faith? You know, we're living by faith. We're the faith generation, the faith church. There were things that Abraham did that qualified him to be a faith man. 
to be called by God as somebody of faith. He set up his posterity. Good fathers will set up their posterity to be numerous, to be greater than themselves. Fathers are true stand-up guys. They are the best examples and benchmarks that they can possibly be. Because the, the, that word says, he will command his children and his household after him. That is, they will behave like him. Fathers set examples. Hello, friends. And not just examples about making money. Because some of us work ourselves ragged. We're making money. And all we've got to say to our children sometimes is, I'm doing it all for you. Can't you see all I'm doing for you? No, they didn't send you to work. They, most children are just content with, with, with regular meals. They need you. They need you to set the example of prayer. The example of meditation. The example of good works. The example between you and their mother. That interaction. They're watching you. They need you to set good examples. Says Abraham. God had looked into Abraham. God had assessed Abraham. Had appraised him and came to a conclusion. This guy will do. Because he has all these qualities. And listen friends. Dads, fathers, sorry, I'm not really telling you well done, well done, well done today, you know. Maybe that's what you came prepared for. Mm. You know, well done. This is a man's world. <laughs> It'll be nothing. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> brethren, there are none of these qualities that I've mentioned that we cannot learn. So even if you weren't born like that, there are none of these qualities that cannot be learned. And it's never too late. Hmm? It's never too late to be a good dad. It's ne no, let's rephrase that. It's never too late to be a better dad dad because we can all be better now the truth is like the apostle paul says sometimes you know was it philippians one or two where he was boasting i am this i am that if i must boast i'll boast in the lord the truth is i'll pitch my kids against anybody's kids any day i said if there was a kid show about good kids best kids i'll sign my kids up they'll beat your kids <laughs> Yeah, call it Boston or whatever. I'm a good dad. I'm a very good dad. <laughs> I'm a good dad. I know what I'm talking about. I'm the kind of dad that actually, before I had children, I studied dadhood. Actually, I was scared. I was really petrified that I will wreck my children. When it was time to try for babies, as we do, I, I said to Margaret, I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I, was, I was petrified. I thought I would wreck my children. There's, there's no way I won't wreck my children. I, I was really afraid. I was petrified. It took some praying. It took some deliverance. It took some study of the word of God. It took many chapters from Dr. Dobson. I heartily recommend Dr. Dobson to all the dads in the house, especially his books about boys and his books about dads and boys. I read them, studied them, ingested them, regurgitated them, read them, studied them, did what I had to do. I'm a good dad. I can tell you how to be a good dad. I think I'm old enough to say stuff like that now, actually. <laughs> Maybe in my 20s, I couldn't. I can tell you that. Let's go to another passage. Okay, we've got five points from there, haven't we? The fulfillment of God's plan for you depends on discharging your fatherhood road well. Um, good fathers are governors for God and navigators of his will and purpose. Fathers establish legacy through their good stewardship. Fathers set their posterity up to be greater than them. And fathers are true stand-up guys. They are 
great examples. Five points? Okay. We'll develop this. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9. First test chapter 2. Let's look at some more fatherhood qualities. And this is what we need to do. We need to get a hold of these qualities and tell ourselves, this is what I need to be. It's a point of the scriptures. It's not just for reading and feeling good. It's, it's for change. <laughs> it's for reading it. And when it, when it comes against a way that I've been doing things, I'm supposed to yield to the scriptures. In all of my learning, in all of my understanding of the mind of God, I'm supposed to yield to it. Okay? Not just know that that's the mind of God. And in yielding to it, it not only changes my worldview, my belief systems, it changes my lifestyle. I'm supposed to behave differently, consistently. Huh? First test two. Verse 9, for you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be burdened to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You know, pastor, I wish, I wish to God that many more men of God would actually do this, would be like this, who work night and day, so as not to be a burden to the church. Oh, mind you, don't get this twisted. The, the Bible says very clearly that you shall not muzzle the ox that threshes the corn, that he that serves at the altar should also eat at the altar. He that, you know, the Bible gives ministers a very clear and unequivocal mandate to be sustained by the income of the ministry. That's not what I'm not talking about, okay? I don't want anyone run away from here and say, oh, pastor should not be paid. Oh, no, no, no. We need pain. But the Apostle Paul and his team, many times when they went to plant churches and build churches up, they did their own work so that they would not be chargeable to any church. You are witnesses, verse 10, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. Verse 11, just as you know, and this is where we're going about fatherhood, how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. So he uses the analogy of a father there, comparing himself as a father to these guys. We can learn some things here. It's there. Fathers deal with each child. It's interesting. If you read it too quickly, you'll miss that. He said we were imploring, teaching, encouraging each one of you. He didn't say all of you. Each one of you. Fathers deal with each child. And they are very different. It's a job. It's a job. We get to learn, not just be familiar with the children. Listen friends, fathers, it's not just mommy's job to know the kids. In fact, I will submit to you later on something, a, a, a statement that you have to take away. It's not just mommy's job to know the kids. He says, like a father would his own children. Each child. It's a job for us. You must set yourself the goal as much as you do at work or in your career. Because you don't take that for granted, do you? You must keep your CPDs up. You don't take that for granted. You should set yourself a goal to know each of your child intimately. If you're each of your children, speaking rubbish English now, I didn't just come in, I've been around for a while. Um, each of your children intimately. I'm not just fresh off the boat, that's what I mean. Uh, <laughs> you must know them intimately. It takes taking them out individually, playing with them individually, not necessarily together. If you have three children, you... You need to spend time with each of them, not just with all of them together. Each of them. To know them each separately. That's why Paul could write something like this. Good fathers deal with each child. Good fathers are coaches and mentors. They drive, they comfort, 
and they draw the children. Do you know, I had not seen this bit before, before I started preparing for, for, for this trip. And I thought, well, that's interesting. That's, that's lovely. That's so cool. They drive the comfort and they draw the children. That's what he said. He said, he said we encourage, we exhort, and we implore. That's what those three terms mean. We can turn them any which way we want. But it's the job of a coach. It's the job of a mentor to drive somebody. You know, to drive someone is to push them. You keep pushing them. Because they're not really living up to their max yet. You're pushing them. Come on, go. Do, do. Be, do, do. But also, it's the job of a coach and a mentor hmm, to be with. To encourage. That is to be with. To walk alongside. Let's do together. To walk alongside. It's also the, the job of a father, a good father, a coach and a mentor to be in front of, to draw. So not only are you driving, but are you also drawing. But not only are you drawing, you're also walking with. So you're behind, you're with, and you're in front of. Those are what those terms mean. We exhort, we encourage, and we implore. Imploring is in the front. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Encourage is right beside. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Exhortation is right behind. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> That's what we do. Especially with your man child. Because testosterone does something to those boys <laughs> at a certain age. And if you're not a confident dad, I don't mean a dominant dad. We're not in the animal kingdom. That's where they dominate by willpower and sheer force. I don't care what your background was. It's not about dominance. I'm going to show you that in a second. If you're not a confident dad, that boy will lead you. And it won't be like the scriptures that say, a little child shall lead them. <laughs> we are teaching. We are comforting. We are giving witness. Next point. This is point number eight now. Fathers, parents with purpose. The parents with purpose. And the purpose is what? A progressive life transformation. A conformity that is worthy of God's will. It says we encourage, we implore each one of you as a father would his own children. Verse 12, so that, that's that phrase again, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. That's the purpose. The purpose of being a good father is to make great children who are walking in the will of God. It's beyond my name. I mean, I revel in that as well. I mean, my boy is away right now doing some training somewhere. And uh, the last thing, one of the last things they heard from me is, remember, remember who you are. Remember who we are. I said... Make sure you add, as great as your hosts are going to be, make sure you only add to them. Don't let them subtract from you. That was the last thing he heard from me at the train station. <laughs> Remember who you are. The purpose is conformity to God's will. It's not just about my name. Let's move on. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. So then, before we look at Hebrews, I can sum up some of what I've been saying so far under the phrase, I like, I like using this, this, uh, this compound term very much, not just in uh, parenting, because as a father you are a parent, but also in marriage, intentional and intelligent. Um... By the way, I'm also a mediator. I'm a um, divorce and separation mediator. I'm also a, uh, a uh, what do you call it, court certified uh, parenting coach. I'm a this, I'm a that. So I, a lot of my clients hear this term from me a lot. Intentional and intelligent. You have to be intelligent. You have to be intentional about this stuff we're talking about. Intentional being, I mean to do it. 
you make a plan to do something you're intentional about it i mean we meant to come here right did we not check the map yesterday it was intentional it was not accidental being here <laughs> It was very, very intentional. A lot of the good stuff that happens in many homes, unfortunately, is accidental. It is as good as the Lord causing his rain to fall and his sun to shine on both the righteous and the unrighteous. You have to be intentional. That's why I could beat my chest earlier on. A bit of a joke fair play but also i mean it i knew what i was doing <laughs> by the time i started doing it you need to know what you're doing dads you need to know what you're doing with those kids don't just wing it don't just wing it don't just pray 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 you need to have a plan what you're doing with them remember this children only do what they're told to do and what they're allowed to do even by law so this whole idea of oh he wouldn't do that she wouldn't do that ah, come to just one single class we'll get her we'll get her to eat peas only broccoli only she will and she will be loving it for the rest of her life we need to be intentional and intelligent about our parenting. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 7. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children, not sons. And remember that curse of illegitimacy? It puts a distance between you and God and his purposes. Furthermore, we have earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. So that, again, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, discipline is for training, in case I miss that later, it's for training. It's not for punishment. If you grew up where I grew up, which is K2 in Lagos, discipline is for punishment. Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. As hard as we were disciplined, it didn't yield fruit of righteousness. I can tell you a few stories until jesus picked me up in 1984. before then there was no fruit of righteousness and that tree was constantly being grafted with other kinds of plants too there were fruits and righteousness so don't get this twisted right point number nine we're, we're gleaning from uh from hebrews now Good fathers discipline their children. We'll examine this word in a minute. <laughs> Good fathers discipline their children for fruitfulness in holiness. There is a purpose though. And remember what I said about intentional parenting. You've got to know where you're going. You want an apple tree? You've got to know what it looks like when you go to the garden store to buy one. All right? And then you've got to know how to nurture it. You've got to know how to feed it. You've got to know when it's likely to bear fruit. You've got to know what pest is likely to be susceptible to so that you can be ahead of the pesticides, okay? You, and all that stuff. I'm not a gardener. It's since I went to Wales, I've learned all kinds of things, okay? Right. You've got to learn all sorts of things. You need to know where you want your kids, which direction they need to aim. But going deeper into that is for another class entirely. There is a purpose. It is akin to the right placement, to the right feeding, to the right pruning, etc., 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 of a vineyard. You have to treat those children like a vineyard. Or, modern terms, at least like your career that you treasure so much. 
And trust me, God will ask you about those kids before he asks you about your career. I can, I can, I can bet apples to gold on that. All right? Point number 10. Good fathers know they only have a short period for discipline. You only have a short period. You see, it was no mistake that Paul said, or whoever wrote Hebrews said earlier on, the discipline does but only for a short period. Because very soon you're out of the house anyway. I remember the day I resisted my mom, finally. I'm going to tell you a, a quick side story here. The day I told my son, he was like, you did what? Yeah. I was about 18 plus. I was in A-levels. And we used to get flogged recklessly anyhow. I know, anyway, you know the score. But my mom was an expert. <laughs> she was an educator, school principal, and she grew up from the rocks, she told us. You know, she grew up from the rocks. And she, my mom would be on top of you and be doing you a Tyson. I'm telling you. <laughs> she, she'll, she'll kick you, she'll bite you, she'll do anything to you. <laughs> my mom cracked a, the edge of a pillar with my brother's head. And some concrete, some concrete came off, some plaster came off. He still got that mark on his head, my big brother. My mom will kill you. And I'm not being a comedian here. So, <laughs> those memories. So, <laughs> we can laugh about them now. Repeat it honestly. Uh, if, but for Jesus, that's another sermon. I'm going to tell you a story about PTSD someday. But anyway... The day I, I, I finally resisted mom, I don't know what got into me. She just came out as she did. The, got the cane, got whatever, and she was at me, and I just embraced her. And I held her and I said, Mommy, no, not today. And in my head, I'm thinking, Dude, <laughs> dude, you're going to die because you'll bite your face off right now. So I held her, I said, no, 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 mommy, I'm, this is not happening again. No, 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 no. She cut loose, tried to go for it again, I restrained her because I was old, I was big enough. You see, it's the force of will that, <clears throat> sorry, I'm digressing. Anyway, so I held her. My big brother came out, he's like, Femi, are you? Because she's shouting, Dele, come, your brother is beating me. She's lying now. He's killing me. I said, I'm, I'm shouting, but I'm not killing anybody. I'm not beating. I'm just holding her. So then he's rushing. Femi, 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 Femi. So he got there. And I said, I'm just holding mommy. I'm not eating cane again. I'm not eating cane again. And that was it. Oh my God, 40 minutes is gone. So anyway, cut a long story short. That was the end of it. I was only 18. Short period of time. That's all you got. Before they can actually say no to anything anymore. I promise you this one thing. If you do it right, even at age 40, you'll still be able to pick a bride for your son. Amen. If you do it right. No matter how old they are, they'll still call you and say, what should I do? Because you're still wise, right? Just because they're older doesn't mean you stopped growing. <laughs> the wiser they get, the wiser you're getting. Till you die, you should be wiser than your children. <laughs> if you do it right. Okay, moving on quickly because 40 minutes is gone. I'm not stopping now. <sighs> Good fathers, Ephesians chapter 6 and we'll close with this one. <laughs> ah, you'll see fight today. I'm not stopping Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. And I, I will finish in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes, a few minutes. Ephesians 6 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Why didn't he say parents? Why didn't he say mothers? Go and check the word. It, it, it's particularly fathers. Do not provoke your children to anger because it's you fathers that do it the most. Do you know, even with all the abuse we suffered at my mom's hands, my siblings are more angry at my dad, who hardly ever touched us. Yet he's the one we're angry at. <laughs> it's incredible. It's you. 
Don't provoke. You're, you're the ones who will provoke them either by your action or inaction. Where were you when all this was happening? I submit to you, therefore, this is submission I was saving for you, that the primary task of instruction and nurture of the children rests with the father. Primary, I say, not the soul, not the complete, not the entire task, but the primary task rests with the dad. So make it part of your job, not just your, not, not only your seven to eight job that you're doing and coming home knackered and thinking, oh, mom has taken care of them. Then on Saturday, you've got to polish that car. You've got to go play golf and all this business. The children are a job. I know I'm speaking to those who've kind of, the horse has bolted a little. You've got children already. But I, when I talk to those who are not married yet, I tell them, you've got to plan the children as much as you're planning your career. They are a job. You've got to plan it. Folks, I have taken lesser jobs just to be with my kids. I should be a lot richer than I am today. But guess what? My kids, this is such a great payoff. I'm telling you, it's messing me up. It's a job. It's my job. Primary task. Yes, it's a joint effort, but the father bears that primary responsibility. Surely it follows that if he's the head of his family, according to Ephesians chapter 5, the head of his wife, he is also the head of his family. Yes, if he's going to guide his wife spiritually and create leadership there, surely it follows that he, he is the leader of, of the children as well. Now let's look at a couple of meanings before I close. Provoke, what does it mean? Moving somebody to a place of irritation and resentment. By action or inaction. Dads, be careful. You must stay ahead of that. Stay ahead of it. We should know our children well. We know their emotional and personality makeup so that we are aware of their different thresholds and be careful not to drive them over the edge. Be careful not to drive them over the edge. Remember, the aim is to nurture and to build up, not to dominate or to wear down. As Dobson Dobson would say, we must learn how to shape the will without breaking the spirit. You'll get that from his book, Dare to Discipline. I totally recommend it. And this includes the readiness to apologize or repent when we miss it. It will teach our children a good lesson of self-awareness and good reflection. He says, bring up the children according to the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What does bring there mean? It means to nurture and to nourish. It's the same words used in Ephesians 5.29 in consideration of nurturing your wife. He says, nurture the children as well. Nurture them, bring them along. Now, let's get to this word, which I can't go without talking about discipline. Because it's such a, everybody has some sense about discipline. Biblical discipline <laughs> means to instruct. It's originally instruction for children. It evolved to, me, evolved to mean some chastening. Listen, it is not penal punishment or retribution. Let's just get this clear. Penal punishment is paying back what you owe to society for bad behavior. It's not necessarily designed to change your mind. It's designed so that you feel pain. The change of mind is your choice. Retribution <laughs> is punishment that is meant to break you down. Like hell, hell is pure retribution. There's no getting out of it if you're in it. Discipline is primarily about instruction and then correction. Even if that correction involves a measure of pain. It was originally used to bring up a child, to educate that child 
It is used of activity directed towards the moral and spiritual nurture and training of the child. It is designed to influence conscious will and action, conformity to the divine will. I've spelled all that out. Hopefully it's captured on the recording if you want to go back to it. Why am I spelling it out? Because there's so much confusion today about discipline. It's not about beating a child. But mind you, it doesn't necessarily exclude the rod of correction, which the book of Proverbs speaks about, Proverbs 22, 23, 29, the rod of correction. It doesn't exclude it necessarily, but it's primarily about instruction guidance training and that's where the word disciple comes from jesus doesn't beat us <laughs> but like the book of hebrews says we get chastened sometimes by difficult circumstances so try to employ um, deprivation of privileges removal of privileges um, instead of these other means sometimes but it's not it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't preclude it don't misunderstand me my children got their fair share of it good fathers are rewarded with joy final statement good fathers are rewarded with joy proverbs 23 24 the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice and he who sires a wise son will be glad in him and the greatest joy of all we can all look forward to moms dads everybody is well done good and faithful servant hmm? so dads sorry if i didn't come with all the well done dads you do so much and all this you know your pastor will tell you that um he'll do all that for you I've come from very far. <laughs> My time is short <laughs> for this discipline. <laughs> and that's why I had to go into what good fathers do. You've got enough points there to digest. Let us say thank you to God. Father, thank you. Father, I thank you first of all for, my, for the opportunity to bring your word here. Who is sufficient for these things, Lord? Thank you for this privilege. I don't take it lightly. Thank you, O oh God. And I thank you for these kind people who have asked me to come and talk to them. Lord, I ask you, O oh God, that your spirit will do what he does. He will convert this into the energy that will do your will. Make it so, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name we prayed. Amen. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for that powerful message. Happy Father's Day, everyone.